Our story begins in the Samburu National Park in northern Kenya. In a now famous incident, a young lioness adopted several oryx calves. She was christened Kamanyak, or the Blessed One in Samburu, and she became something of a national heroine. But her behaviour baffled scientists. Oryx are typical lion prey in the Samburu, but Kamunyak is fiercely protective of her calf. Why should a lion adopt an antelope? It hardly makes sense in a world where survival is supposed to depend on reproduction. According to evolutionary theory, the goal of every species of animal is to transmit its genes to the next generation. Lions and oryx don't share the same genetic makeup, so Kamunyak isn't doing herself any favours by caring for this baby. Time spent on an antelope is time wasted on her own survival. She won't hunt. She may not even reproduce. Darwin said all animals are out to reproduce as many quality individuals as possible. Clearly, this is not Kamunyak's case. And she's not alone. Adoption and similar behaviours like fostering are common in the natural world. The theory of evolution is the foundation of modern biology. But could explaining adoption be its greatest failure? One thing is certain. Today, biologists have great difficulty explaining the phenomenon. In Jerusalem, Eitan Avital and Eva Jablonka have seized the nettle of an apparent paradox. If you help or adopt offspring that are not yours and are not even genetically related to you, you seem to waste a lot of time and energy to invest in uh, offspring that don't carry your genes. And of course, the theory of evolution can't really understand anything that is a total waste of time and energy. Take wolves, for example. As Mowgli discovered, fostering is common in this species. Wolves are social animals, living in packs that comprise a breeding couple, their offspring and extended families. The group's only breeding female gives birth in the spring in an underground den. For the first three weeks, this female will keep other pack members away from her young. She cleans and nurses them, moving them around by picking them up gently in her mouth. With the transition from milk to solids at between five and ten weeks, mother turns her cubs over to the pack. Wolves not only hunt together, they share in other collective responsibilities, protecting the den and raising the young. The cubs soon begin to recognise members of their extended family, who will keep them clean and well fed. The pups progress quickly, both physically and socially, to follow their family to the site of a kill. Whatever its place in the pack, a wolf can steal food from any other. Every member aggressively defends its morsel. But the cubs are an exception. Amid the snarling and backbiting around the family table, cubs enjoy unrestricted access to the kill. to help themselves to the carcass.
If the cubs want more, they lick the muzzles of their foster parents. If the adult has a full stomach, he'll regurgitate food for the pup. Wolves are sexually mature by the age of two. According to Darwin, these young adults should be having their own offspring. So why are they hanging around home, helping to raise their brothers and sisters? It seems that young wolves stand little chance of successfully raising their own litter. Their habitat is so harsh that they're better off staying within the group until they're tough enough to go it alone. By helping their little brothers and sisters survive, these young adults also benefit indirectly because genes can in fact be passed on, not just through children, but through relatives or kin. Off as a mistake or as a byproduct of selection for another behavior. But in central Poland, we find an extraordinary exception. Hundreds of common gulls arrive here in the spring to breed on the scattered islands of the Vistula River. After wintering over Western Europe, these gulls return to the place they were born to bring up their own young. They nest in colonies of several to hundreds of individuals. In late April, early May, the female lays between one and three eggs at intervals. After 25 days incubation, the first egg hatches, followed quickly by a second. The third chick won't be born for another day, sometimes two, leaving it, as we'll see, severely disadvantaged. Darius and Monika Bukaczynski of the Polish Center for Ecological Research have been studying the breeding habits of these gulls for several years. To identify chicks when they're born, the Bukaczynskis dye them three different colors, mm -hmm. starting with the eldest, <laughs> then the second chick, Finally, the late hatched third chick is dyed blue. The chicks are brooded for a week and are guarded by one or both parents until they fledge. Throughout this time, they stay close to home where they're fed on regurgitated food. The blue chick's trouble is that his two elder siblings enjoy a head start. They're consequently first and second in line when it comes to getting fed. In a bad year, the blue chick's chances of survival are slim, especially if his parents are young and inexperienced. He'll always be last in the pecking order, managing only to pick at scraps. These late-born chicks often abandon their birth parents and set out to seek better care from a new foster family in the colony. This is one of the rare occasions in nature when a youngster solicits its own adoption, and it's no mean feat as the journey is perilous. The common gull's black-headed neighbors are particularly aggressive towards foreign chicks. The chick has found a new family on the dunes. The question is, will he be accepted not only by his foster brothers and sisters, but more importantly, by their parents? He hesitates before approaching them. but his attempt to get himself adopted seems to be a success. He's fed along with the other chicks.
Adoptions are a frequent occurrence in common girl colonies. So much so that Monica and Darius Bukasinski find it difficult to believe that girl parents are simply making mistakes. It would appear that in the case of the common girl, adoption is adaptive, as it's difficult to believe that a phenomenon that occurs with such frequency in these colonies could just be by chance. The genetic structure of common gulls has revealed kin relationships among these birds which would favour adoption and mean that costs are minimal or non-existent. Generation after generation of common gulls adopt. It's thought the behaviour might be transmitted as a style of parenting. In the same way that vicious cycles of abuse occur in families, Eva Jablonka thinks benevolent cycles of tolerance might be passed on from adults to chicks. You don't mind them very much, you're not very aggressive towards them. Your own chicks see this behaviour and when they will grow up, they, in their turn, may be also more tolerant to, towards the foreign chicks. Or, for example, you may actively kidnap young. Again, this behaviour, the, beha the kidnapping behaviour, can also be socially learned by young who have to see this behavior if they are to practice it later in their lives. If chicks learn this behavior from their parents, what happens if the egg of a black-headed gull, which pecks intruders to death, is placed in the nest of a common gull? Will the black-headed gulls grow up to tolerate foreign chicks? Monica and Darius Bukasinski are testing the theory. For now, the jury's still out.